America invented car culture, designing their cities, their economy, their politics, and their society around the ownership of the humble automobile. And for a fleeting golden era of around 30 years, the nation's love affair with motoring appeared to be a symbol that the rest of the world aspired to replicate. Then, on October 6, 1973, the golden era suddenly came to an end, and decades of corporate inefficiency and highly uneconomical and flawed designs finally faced a cold realisation, and for the remainder of the century, the US car industry was forced to struggle against an oncoming tide of foreign metal, as millions of buyers across the nation turned to their own builders and said they wanted something else, the start of what would be known as the malaise era of American motoring. Although America's place on the world stage of motoring started largely with the creation of the Ford Model T in 1908, the world's first mass-production car, and one that was affordable to the expanding middle and lower classes, it wasn't until after World War II that what would be known as car culture came to cement itself in the national character of the USA. In the years following the end of the conflict, America's economy was booming and money was plentiful, while on the global stage, the USA was maintaining the side of capitalism in a war of ideologies against the communist Soviet Union. Therefore, as an endemic symbol of mobility, ownership of a car was put front and centre of the American dream. Combined with technological advancements, including power steering and power brakes, car travel was transformed from a simple mode of transportation to an extension of oneself, a status symbol that openly displayed one's wealth and tastes, whether they be rich or poor, or flamboyant or understated, compounded further by the rising trend for space-age styling flavour that incorporated gigantic chrome fins, long sweeping bodies, and streamlined profiles, resulting in such classics as the Chevrolet Corvette, the Bel Air, the Ford Thunderbird, and the Cadillac Series 62. Sadly, while on the surface, these cars were stylistic gems, underneath, their mechanics and design were somewhat primitive, being powered by highly inefficient though very powerful V6 and V8 engines that provided performance that was lethargic and unresponsive, while also being built to physical dimensions that made them only suitable for the wide boulevards and highways of the United States, while little investment was made in scaled-down versions for the export market. The reality was that cars built in the United States were aimed squarely at the American buyer and their love of car culture, while also not compromising on power, as fuel cost a mere $2.93 per barrel, or $27.61 in 2020, thanks largely to plentiful domestic oil supplies supplemented by shipments from wells in the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf region. However, keeping the Arabian states on side with car culture sometimes required intervention, as was the case during the 1953 Iranian coup, when, following the nationalisation of the Persian petroleum industry by newly elected Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mozadeh, specifically the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, a British corporation now part of the BP Group, a coup was orchestrated by Britain, the Central Intelligence Agency of America, and Iran's monarch Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, in collusion with Tehran's criminal underworld, to rise up against Mozadeh on August 15, 1953, resulting in his overthrow four days later, but only after two to three hundred people had been killed in violent clashes, while many of Mozadeh's government officials and followers were imprisoned and put to death in subsequent weeks and months. Back in America, despite an eight-month-long slump during the Eisenhower recession of 1958, consumerism and the economy continued to boom, while the Detroit Big Three, Ford, General Motors and the Chrysler Group a trio of long-standing firms that had expanded their massive empires through the purchase of dozens of individual car brands such as Buick, Cadillac, Lincoln, Plymouth and Oldsmobile, were now made the wealthiest car builders in the world, able to suitably weather the storm of commercial failures like the misguided Edsel, due to their ability to sell one successful model after another, with each generation of car models usually being fundamentally altered between two to five years. This frequent refresh of the model range wasn't merely an aesthetic choice though but more down to a process of planned obsolescence being undertaken by the Detroit Big Three, the intention being that in order to keep buyers coming back to the showrooms, rather than holding on to their cars for up to a decade without changing, the car makers guaranteed an operational life for each model of around three to five years, after which the number of mechanical, electrical and physical faults with the car would eventually cost more than what it was worth, especially after factoring in depreciation. By the time the car had reached the point of being a total loss, the Detroit Big Three would release the next generation of the model, and thus buyers would be allowed to part exchange their old model for a new one, with the old one, having essentially become life expired, being sent immediately to the breaker's yard. This strategy keeping buyers coming back time and again to Ford, General Motors and Chrysler showrooms, while also ensuring that independent second-hand dealers suffered 
as the potential to sell used cars that weren't beyond economical repair was very narrow. As an example, the Ford Thunderbird went through six generations in its first 20 years on sale, being launched in 1955, followed by new models in 1958, 1961, 1964, 1967, and 1972. Furthermore, as consumerism grew, so did the technology, and, most crucially, the engine sizes, with some cars sporting engine displacements that exceeded 6 litres, including the 6.4-litre Cadillac Series 62 of 1959, the 7-litre Ford Thunderbird of 1958, the 7.6-litre Lincoln Continental of 1961, and by far the most outrageous being the 1971 Cadillac Eldorado, which was notable for having the largest engine displacement in an American mass-production car at the time, with a gigantic 8.2-litre Cadillac V8 compounded further by the appearance of muscle cars and pony cars in the mid to late 1960s, which took the underpinnings of regular family saloons, such as the Ford Falcon, and reworked them with stylized bodies and sporty images, to create affordable but highly inefficient performance machines that undercut dedicated European Grand Tourers and sports cars, perhaps the most famous of which was the Ford Mustang, one of the most successful cars ever made. The only American car builder that made a modest attempt to buck the trend of gigantic land yachts and snarling, fuel-thirsty muscle cars was the American Motors Corporation, or AMC, which was formed in 1954 through the merger of manufacturers Nash Kelvinator and the Hudson Motor Car Company, who combined their assets in order to remain competitive against the Detroit Big Three, while aiming to provide cars with smaller dimensions and less costly engine displacements, with models like the Rambler 6, a family saloon that came under the Rambler mark, being 15.9 feet long and fitted with a 3.2-litre inline-six engine producing 120 horsepower and sporting a fuel consumption of 19.2 miles per gallon, a humble choice compared to the equivalent 1957 Ford, which was 16.9 feet in length, fitted with a 5.8 litre FE V8 producing 270 horsepower, and had a fuel consumption of 12.9 miles per gallon. Therefore, AMC became very popular among middle class buyers, while also introducing notable innovations nearly a decade before the big three offered them as options, including an automatic shift indicator sequence a standard tandem master cylinder that would stop the car in the event of a brake failure, and standard dual reclining front seats. As for the wider market, in the wake of tragedies such as the Bay of Pigs incident and the Kennedy assassination, American culture began to become more cynical, and the opulent nature of the 1950s was now seen to be a thinly veiled smokescreen of wealth and prosperity that hid a multitude of social, political and environmental problems. Aside from the chrome, fins and sweeping profiles, being toned down into understated machines with boxy shapes, straight lines, and hard angles, the unchecked emission outputs of American cars had enveloped cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago in huge clouds of smog filled with vaporized, unburnt fuel, forcing the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, to respond with the Clean Air Act of 1963 and the Vehicle Air Pollution and Control Act of 1965, which was the start of motions within the government to curtail the pollution of American cars through the creation of more efficient engines. Planned obsolescence was still a problem, though, compounded further by the use of non-biodegradable materials that form most of the interior trim on American luxury cars, with the supple leather seats being a cocktail of fabric and polyurethane, while the dashboards were smothered in faux wood born from polyvinyl chloride. But these matters aside, it was still business as usual for the American car makers by the dawn of the 1970s, unaware that their success was built on unstable foundations. The day of reckoning came for American car culture, on October 6, 1973, the Jewish Holy Day of Yom Kippur, when a coalition of Arab nations led by Egypt and Syria launched an attack on Israeli positions, the goal of the Egyptians being to take back the Sinai Peninsula, a body of land between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea annexed by Israel during the Six-Day War of 1967, while Syria attempted to capture the Golan Heights, which had also been occupied by the Israelis during the same conflict. While Egypt and Syria sought the assistance of nations in the Arab world, including Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco, as well as receiving financial and technological backing from Cuba and the Soviet Union, the Israelis turned to America and the West for assistance, which was provided by the Nixon administration and thus helped to repel the Arab assault. But the intervention of the West on the side of Israel struck an ill chord with the Arab world, resulting in the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, implementing an embargo on oil exports to nations that showed support towards Israel, initially Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, Great Britain and the United States, but followed later by Portugal, Rhodesia and South Africa. The results were alarming. Oil prices increased by nearly 400%, 
a spike from $3 per barrel to $12 globally, and the post-war economic bubble that had funded the prosperity of the Western nations for the past 25 years was burst, culminating in the worst economic recession since the end of World War II. Businesses went bankrupt, the price of living skyrocketed, and America's gigantic gas guzzlers were now completely out of step with this new era of austerity and prudence, the Detroit Big Three taking the impact hardest of all, as their market shares collapsed in the face of customers abandoning their gigantic, inefficient gas guzzlers, and instead turning to a new breed of economy models produced by Europe and Japan, nations that had long designed their cars around fuel rationing and limited physical space. While European cars had been present on the American market since the end of World War II, Japanese models were a recent appearance, with the first model to arrive on US shores being the 1958 Toyota Crown sedan, sold under the company's brand for small family cars, Toyopet. Although Japanese cars were seen initially as a joke in the West, they soon gained traction, with 127,000 Toyotas being sold in the USA during 1969 alone, as buyers appreciated the car's favourable fuel consumption, reasonable dimensions, and superb build quality. In a comparison between two contemporary American and Japanese cars for the 1972 model year, the Toyota Corona Mark II and the Ford LTD sedan, the base model Toyota Corona was 14 feet long, 5.3 feet wide, weighed 1 ton, and was fitted with a 1.7 litre 6R inline 4 engine, producing 103 horsepower, a 0 to 60 time of 15.2 seconds, a top speed of 103 miles an hour, and an average fuel consumption of 25 miles per gallon, while the base model Ford LTD was 18.2 feet long, 6.6 .6 feet wide, weighed 2 tons, and was fitted with a 4.9 litre Windsor V8, producing 163 horsepower, a 0 to 60 time of 13.3 seconds, a top speed of 106 miles an hour, and an average fuel consumption of 12 miles per gallon. Prices were also much more favourable to the Toyota, with a brand new Corona costing $2,055, or $12,500 in 2020, including shipping and import taxes, while the Ford LTD cost $3,882, or 23700 in 2020, meaning that to buy the LTD was to pay an extra $1,827 for a 2 second faster 0 to 60 time, a 3 mile an hour increase in top speed, and an average fuel consumption that was nearly 13 miles per gallon worse than the Toyota. Therefore, following the crisis of October 1973, foreign motors marched onto the American market in their droves, while the smaller AMC proved also to be an early winner of the fuel crisis due to their accurate prediction that comparatively economic cars like the Gremlin, Hornet and Pacer would one day be in vogue, though their success didn't match that of the widespread foreign crop. While the OPEC embargo finally ended in March 1974, it was clear to the American government that too much reliance had been placed on foreign oil imports, and thus, on December 22, 1975, Congress implemented the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, or EPCA, a comprehensive approach to federal energy policy by increasing energy production and supply, reducing energy demand, providing energy efficiency, and giving the executive branch additional powers to respond to disruptions in energy supply while the implementation of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the Energy Conservation Program for Consumer Products, and the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Regulations, or CAFE, demanded US car builders improve the average efficiency and fuel economy of their models, with a gas guzzler tax being levied on individual passenger cars, excluding trucks, vans, minivans, or SUVs, with an average fuel consumption less than 22.5 miles per gallon. As an initial reaction, the car makers took their existing models and strangled the mechanical performance of their engines, reducing their compression, tuning down their power output, and fitting them with catalytic converters. But while this cut the power of giant 6-litre and 7-litre V8 power plants to a measly 125 to 150 horsepower, it only served to make these cars underpowered for their size and did little to improve the fuel efficiency, with the likes of the doctored Lincoln Continental and Cadillac Eldorado still sporting a fuel consumption of around 13 miles per gallon. Investment in economy cars was another early step to resolving the issue of inefficiency and meet cafe regulations, and indeed some economy models and subcompacts, like the Ford Pinto, had been introduced before the crisis in order to match Japanese models, but the resulting slew of first-generation economy cars had numerous design flaws due to their rushed nature, the Pinto famously causing controversy when the position of its fuel tank meant that, in the event of a rear-end collision, the car would burst into flames, while the equivalent Chevy Vega of 1970 which received favourable reviews upon its launch, garnered notoriety for its poor reliability and crash safety concerns. While Ford fared better with subsequent economy cars, such as the somewhat successful Maverick of 1973, 
Granada of 1975, and Fairmont of 1978, General Motors found difficulty perfecting the formula. With the Chevrolet Chevette of 1975, built to rival the Renault Le Car and the Volkswagen Rabbit, being rushed into production and, due to its lack of refinement, comfort, build quality and performance, receiving poor reviews. Worst hit by the oil crisis was the Chrysler Group, which, as the smallest of Detroit's big three, was forced to abandon its luxury mark, Imperial, in 1975, while the company's European division, which had a controlling share in the Roots Group of Britain, was eventually sold to Peugeot in 1978 after years of sustained losses, compounded largely by the lasting legacy of the Hillman Imps' failure during the 1960s, with the lack of funds meaning the firm struggled to develop their own in-house economy car, their smallest model, the Dodge Colt of 1971, being a quick rebadging of the Mitsubishi Colt Galant of Japan, while the Plymouth Cricket was a rebanded Hillman Avenger from Chrysler's European division. Unfortunately, just as American car builders began to implement long-term plans, the US economy took another severe blow on February 11, 1979, when, after just over a year of protests and calls for his abdication, Iran's last monarch, Mohammad Reza Shah, fled the country with his wife, thereby ushering in the reign of supreme leader Ayatollah Khomeini, who held particular resentment against the United States due to its involvement in the 1953 coup. His campaign against the Shah, starting through the instigation of strikes by 37,000 workers at the country's nationalised oil refineries in November 1978, which reduced production from 6 million barrels per day to around 1.5 million barrels, while also forcing out skilled oil workers and engineers, usually representing Western oil firms such as BP and Shell. Though the Iranian revolution only caused an estimated 4% decrease in global oil supply, the market was thrown into panic, and fuel prices spiked from $15.85 per barrel to $39.50 per barrel, followed a year later by another oil crisis caused by the start of the Iran-Iraq war when Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein took the opportunity of Iran's perceived weakness in the fallout of the revolution to conquer large swathes of the country, resulting in a seven-year war of attrition in which neither side secured victory. In the wake of the 1979 and 1980 oil crises, during which time the phrase Malay's era was coined due to the bleak outlook of US President Jimmy Carter, the American car industry was forced to get tough on car production, with dimensions being downsized significantly, engine displacements curbed, and a new series of badge engineering being undertaken, whereby certain car platforms that could be cheaply made were spread across several different marks, with slight alterations to their performance and interior design. The results were mixed, with the Cadillac Cimarron, an entry-level luxury car introduced in 1982 and based on the General Motors J platform, being lambasted by consumer groups and causing the firm to lose 1.6% of its market share against foreign luxury car makers due to it being a rebranded Chevrolet Cavalier with all the Cavalier's options as standard, and an extra $4,000 price hike, while the implementation of the K-Car platform by Chrysler CEO Lee Iacocca, together with a multitude of loans from the US government in excess of $2 billion, saved the Chrysler Group from collapse, with 25 mid-size models, 7 extended wheelbase models, 5 sports car models, 6 minivan models, and 2 luxury models, being based on this platform over its 8-year circulation. At the same time, Chrysler pioneered what would become the extremely popular minivan in 1984, with the Dodge Caravan and Plymouth Voyager taking the chassis of a regular family car and putting it onto a spacious utilitarian body that could seat seven and operate economically, presenting the buying public with an efficient and practical alternative to the archaic station wagons of the previous decade. Both of these revolutionary car designs helped to turn the Chrysler Group from near bankruptcy in 1980 to incredible success by 1985 spurred on also by the purchase of the highly profitable Jeep mark from the ailing AMC in 1988, which, after its initial success in the early 1970s, struggled to meet demand and was making a loss of $73.8 million as buyers quickly noted the declining quality of their products, while a recall of 310,000 vehicles in 1976 by order of the EPA due to a fault with the pollution control systems cost the firm upward of $3 million, followed by a short-lived partnership with French car builder Renault that ultimately did little to save the company from eventual collapse. The Malays era, as a period of depression in the American car building scene, ended in around 1984, as US manufacturers began to address the problems of fuel efficiency and emissions control, now designing power plants and cars, that suited improved economy in the same manner as the Japanese and Europeans. As such, the big three were able to survive into the 1980s and regain a foothold on the domestic market, but their influence would never be the same again with Japanese and European firms now solidly planted in the USA while opening their own car factories and dealer networks. 
Overall, the Malays era was the medicine American car builders had to take in order to survive, a painful lesson that excessive designs and highly inefficient engines could not be sustained, especially when they were reliant on vulnerable oil imports and a fragile economy. In a period when the United States faced the harrowing prospect of losing its entire car industry to foreign builders, the downsizing, rationalizing, improvement in fuel efficiency, build quality and work practices have culminated in the Detroit Big Three being able to streamline themselves to meet the challenges of a much smaller market share.